This is it. Okay. Much better. Ansel Adams is America's most revered photographer and the world's leading figure in landscape photography. An ardent conservationist, he has spent almost half of this century exploring nature and recording its grandeur in photographs. In this, he follows the path of three other great American photographers, Edward Weston, Paul Strand, and Alfred Stieglitz, all of whom had a profound influence on him. See, if I did it right, we have it at 640. Right. And I put the shadows I put on three. And well, I'm going to drop the shadows again down to two. For well, now, it'll be at 60 to 20 to 32. But I've got to use this extreme front f stop scale. Oh. This one is three f stop scale. Oh, that's right. So that would account for it only four times. <laughs> 22, 32, do you want to yeah. give it? Okay. Born in San Francisco in 1902. Adams has never moved far away from the sweeping landscape of his native California. Exploring the landscape of Yosemite and the Sierra on foot, he began to record in pictures the wilderness he saw. He was soon hooked on photography and gave up a promising career as a concert pianist. That's good. This uh, 10 and 2 thirds are now placed on two, and there's still a trace of detail, mm. and the separation in the white. The water's now. Let's stand a few minutes, it'll be wonderful. But they sure have cut in on that other side. Very good. Good experiment. Adams is considered one of the most outstanding craftsmen in photography. He often prints the same negative again and again in order to achieve flawless pictures of extraordinary tonal virtuosity a technique which has earned him a worldwide reputation. His most famous prints, like the legendary Moonrise over Hernandez Valley, now fetch such high prices that Adams has decided to sell only to museums and institutions. What made you decide to become a photographer? You started as a concert pianist. Well, somebody said it more or less, an inevitable infection. <laughs> I was trained as a pianist and uh, spent the summers in the Sierra. <clears throat> Pardon me, and photograph, photographing all the time. And primarily making records, visual diary. And uh, finally, the pictures began to be a little interesting to me, and I was seeing things better. And I made a first rather good picture in 1923. And then I made my first really visualized photograph in 1927. But I was still piano, but the music was being beginning to erode it a bit. And then I met Paul Strand in 1930 in New Mexico, in Taos, and uh, saw his negatives, and that's what really turned me, turned me over to this decision to be a photographer. Then I tried to keep both the piano and the camera going for several years, but no, it has to be all or none. You can't do it. Do you think the two things are related? Well, I think it was the writer uh, <clears throat> Wodensky, who said that all art is the expression of the same thing. So the relationship, there's nothing direct any more than between painting and sculpture, and, but there's certain aesthetic principles which are automatic and not necessarily taught or formalized. And uh, there is also in photography, or part in music, a very great uh, uh, necessity for discipline. That is, you've got to have the right notes. Did you wait a very long time to achieve that particular image? Well, we don't wait. We come across what is called the found object. That is, that's my approach. In this case, I saw this tree, and I saw the sun, and I realized that it could be a very effective image. So I suppose, uh, after selecting the, the object, I perhaps waited eight to ten minutes simply to get an agreeable sun position. But that's all. This one is very strange. I think it's practically and totally a silhouette. Cartier Bresson says there is a precise moment for taking a photograph. Yeah, well, he is an absolute genius in the anticipation of the moment. And he not only does that with an individual situation, individual uh, person, but he does it with many people. 
could have a group, several people, several things happening, and his mental computer is able to, to anticipate where everything is going to be. I mean, there's nobody like him. He's, there's a few that approach, like Gene Smith, and, uh, well, there are a few others, but I, don't, I think he is still a superb, when a you, superb anticipator, I call it. When you took this particular photograph, did you know in your mind's eye what it would turn out to be? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was going to be a silhouette. I had hoped I could hold a little more definition here. But the light was changing very fast, and uh, I trusted to memory rather than to uh, another reading. I could have had a little more violent thing in here, but there's nothing in the negative, so it has to be printed very deeply. This is one of my earlier ones, and it's one of my most satisfactory. It happens to be very difficult to print because it was a poorly processed negative. It's taken with a very long lens on a four by five in the Southern Sierra it's called Precipice Lake. And uh, it's a matter of it being there at the right day and the right time. Just a few days later, this ice had melted feeling had disappeared. And in this case, I was very anxious to emphasize this beautiful white door. And if I achieved a higher value throughout, I lost the impact of the door. So it has a, a rather a slightly mournful, intense feeling to it, which uh, that's the way I saw it or visualized it. Yeah. Mr. Adams, this is one of your very first prints, isn't it? Well, the native was made in the early 1930s. But uh, it's, everybody seems to like it, and it's very nostalgic for me. Why is it nostalgic? Well, it's the experience of the place, and the whole southern Sierra is incredible. And uh, this is what we call the Kern River Sierra. And this uh, next one is in the upper Kern, that is northern, near the headwaters. I'm working up here, I guess, about 12,000 feet. 11 to 12,000 feet. And it's just a moon sunrise. This is a setting moon. It's a very difficult thing to print to get feeling of light because if you get the moon lighter, you lose your sky. And <clears throat> it's very interesting that the rock and here in the sun is much brighter than the moon, which is, after all, a very, very dark substance. This is almost an abstract one, isn't it? Well, you bring up an interesting point there as to whether you can <clears throat> actually have abstraction in photography, because you do have the inevitably realistic image of the lens. Uh, I, I like to use the word extract. And uh, the shapes of nature uh, are then organized in the camera, in the mind first, and in the format, and develop towards a form, a formal statement relationship. Uh, it can't be abstract, it can be highly selective. It cannot be abstract because I don't think you can photograph anything which isn't already inherent in yeah. nature. You cannot do what the non-objective painter can do, can build up a series of impressions of uh, abstract colors, I'll say abstract, I'm using that again in a different way, impressions of color and shape and integrate them. With the photographer's problem is to sort of establish a configuration out of chaos. And he has to think of his format and enclosures, uh, relation to texture and values. But again, that comes, it's automatic. I can't sit there and contemplate. Because by the time I finish the contemplation, the sand would be blown away. And I would, have, I would, I would be lost. Are you very aware that you try to preserve fleeting moments? Well, it depends what you call fleeting. Sometimes, uh, in the geologic sense, a year is a very fleeting moment. And sometimes with the people, it's a 25th of a second. <laughs> of course, if I know something is very obvious in just a few moments or a few minutes, it's going to be perfected. If there was a funny little cloud moving out of the sky, if it had no relation to the picture, did nothing for it, I would wait till it left. <clears throat> but on the other hand, if I keep waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, the light changes, the mood changes, the excitement changes. So I'm supposed to see it rather swiftly. The extraordinary tonality of the shades of gray and black and a little bit of white, is that what happens in the camera or is that what happens in the printing? No, you, you see, of course, again, none of my images are, are realistic in terms of values. I mean, the, the original is much softer than the photograph. 
And in order to get a certain vitality, if I kept a lot of shadow in here, I would have a totally different picture. So I sometimes will let things go very deep. In other words, it's, it's a manipulation of value, intentional manipulation. But it also gives the photograph an extraordinary clarity and crispness. It's like the piano. You have 88 keys. You can go from the lowest to the highest, or you usually work within a few octaves. Well, there were some magnificent things within just an octave or two. So it's all a matter of the basic feeling. This, again, is a fleeting moment in nature, and a few hours later, there's a change. It's just a uh, disappearing ice flow on, a, on Ellery Lake that is east of Yosemite. And it, again, it is intentionally the background and the water itself is it very deep, simply because of the excitement of this sunlit illuminated ice. I don't ask me why I did it. I just couldn't help doing it. But I like things usually in fairly soft, rich light. And it's the sunrise in late autumn in the Rocky Mountains. And, uh, and there again, the subjects were very soft and would be very gray and un uh, uninspiring in, a, in a black and white. But it's, again, beautiful in color. But here we have to expand, so we expand the contrast. Because we know we have to have in the print to become exciting value something like this to this. I mean, this is still on the border. There was still substance. It's not a black hole. But if that is a weaker variation, from my point of view, then it would become rather insipid. <clears throat> I like this photograph very much. It was made in Cape Cod many, many years ago. And it's an interesting matter of interpretation because my first prints tried to capture the very soft gray light of the area. And I became dissatisfied with the qualities of the prints. So I simply improved the printing, I think, by increasing values and uh, strength. But there are the two steps. I mean, one is the moment of taking the photograph, and the other one is when you actually print the photograph. Well, <clears throat> that's an important question. Uh, actually, <clears throat> there's, there's two ways. One is to take an average uh, exposure, just shoot, you know. <laughs> and I hate that word, but click. And then you process, and you expect some miracles to happen. The uh, sad fact is they very seldom happen. The attitude of the creative photographer, <clears throat> like, for instance, Edward West and Stignes, people of that caliber, that they saw very clearly in their mind's eye, or in other words, they visualized the image before they made the photograph. Then the technique or the craft is simply applied uh, as, as required. And while you do have certain, you might say, <clears throat> enhancements as you print, things are detailed that become revealed, you never can escape the original visualization. You shouldn't. I mean, that, that's the negative, and you've got it. And I'm guilty of creating a cliche, which I use very often, is that <clears throat> in actuality, the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> negative is like the composer's score. All the information's there. And then the print is a performance. See, so you interpret this score at varying aesthetic emotional levels, but never far enough away to violate the essential concept. So if somebody would take your original negative, which is the score, and print it up, one would end up with a totally different photograph because it's a different performance. I hope it would be different. After all, when I was a pianist, I was playing music of Bach and Vivaldi and Mozart, who not only were long dead, but had never heard a grand piano. So, in a sense, uh, any music <coughs> performance of that music is uh, a sort of a transcription. A contemporary composition, which is made for the contemporary instruments, is something else. Over there, the three prints are from the same negative, aren't they? This is probably my, my first visualization. I chose a filter especially for the dramatic effect of the sky. So I began to see as a dark, heavy sky and intense shadows and so it was made in 1927, and this is the first print, which is about 54 years old. And the big one, the end, was made here at about uh, oh, 1962 or three. And uh, this center one uh, is about maybe five years old. So it's a case of uh, different performances of the of the same uh, negative. But all three of them have totally different emotional qualities, yeah. haven't they? Well, if I were 
pianist and were giving a concert, I probably would play a particular uh, piece uh, very differently in February than I did in June, you see. So, or at least 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 something years difference, you would have a different feeling. So you think a, a negative has infinite uh, possibilities of, of different prints? Well, uh, yes, it, <clears throat> with certain respect for the original intention. But I have sent, I will give all my negatives and archive to the Center of Creative Photography in Tucson. And one of the stipulations with the, the negatives is that the advanced students or serious photographers will have an opportunity to print them for non-commercial use and under academic supervision. They just won't go in and fool with them. There'll be a sense that there'll be negatives that I hope will last for quite a while. And uh, the thing that excites me is that within not too many years, we're going to have an entirely new medium of expression in the electronic image. So I've seen what can happen to uh, a print reproduced by the laser scanner and how that is enhanced, and that's just the beginning. I also have seen some magnificent electronic images, direct, uh, direct electrical, not pictures of pictures. Mm -hmm. And I know the potentials are there. I know it's going to be wonderful. Well, in that sense, the negatives for these photographs, as an example, will take the place of a Frescobaldi or a, 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 a Percival, you know, or some early composer, who will then be reinterpreted through uh, a fresh medium. And I think that is marvelous. <laughs> Uh, this is not a young negative. This is very hard to print. It was taken very early in the morning, autumn morning in Yosemite. The problem is that the values of the cliff and the values of the foliage and things were pretty close, so I had to expand the contrast on this. In a color photograph, this would be a very, very quiet, subtle thing, probably within just a very short range of values, which would be hopelessly dull in, in black and white. So I have allowed the shadows to go down almost to maximum depth, and then these pick up. And the, the difficulty, of course, is trying to separate values like this and rock, because nothing I can do. All these problems have to go through your mind, you know, like a carousel. But you still work totally instinctively. Well, I had to measure everything. I had, a, just at that time, a Western meter. So when I couldn't measure exactly, I could interpolate. And I got a pretty good idea of placements of values. Would you take many photographs for a picture like that? No, I usually take just one, and I never bracket, with the following exception. This, I knew when I took this, it was a good image, it was going to be a good image, so I'd take two for protection. And accidents can happen, scratches and anything that's had nothing to do with the, with the, uh, with the actual photograph. And if you, take the, if you compare the two of them, are they almost identical? They, they would be the same, oh yes. It, and you don't bracket. Now, uh, bracketing is a sign of insecurity when you say, gee, I don't know whether that's F25 and F11, I'd better try F8 and 16 and run, you know, but that, that means you don't really know what you're doing. How and, does one avoid, for instance, a photograph like this just to become merely pretty? Well, that's a matter of taste and, you know, it's your visualization. I can see, I can see all kinds of prettifications, if you want to use the word, but there is something that if it relates to you in an aesthetic sense, that's all you can do. Because the danger of the postcard, of course. The is... danger of the, of the literal postcard uh, is just something that isn't very clearly seen. And again, Weston had made some marvelous remarks, and one of them was that, that composition in photography is the strongest way of seeing. Yes, I mean, during your career, you moved away more and more from a mere pictorial view of the... A painter has a totally different approach. A painter's approach is purely synthetic in the sense he pulls many things together. I don't mean synthetic in the wrong sense. And the photographer's approach is, is, is analytic. This yes, except the painter has the possibilities of an accumulation of time and intentions while the photographer yeah. is the frozen moment. That's to be right, that's right. You're very concerned with mood, obviously. Well, that's part of the visualization, the aesthetic, aesthetic and emotional statement. I think it might be uh, helpful to you to quote Alfred Siegler's statement. Uh, when someone asked him in earlier days when photography was scorned, usually, 
uh, Stiglitz, we don't understand this talk about creative photography and creativity with a mechanical medium. Uh, how do you make a creative photograph? And he replied that uh, he was interested. He would go out in the world with his camera. He would come across something that excited him emotionally, spiritually, uh, and aesthetically. He said, forget all those words. They don't mean much. They're just symbols of something much deeper. And I see the picture in my mind's eye. I, I make the photograph, and I give you the print as the equivalent of what I saw and felt. And that word equivalent is, is, is really profound because it is the equivalent of two things, what he saw and what he felt about the thing. Mr. Adams, your pictures are obviously the true expression of how you feel about life, but you don't like to be very analytical about it. Well, the, the element of verbalization, of explaining what's in the picture, what you feel about it, I think it's very futile, because if it isn't in the picture, right. that's what you're talking about. It. And I've known, I say, some dear friends who are great verbalizers, and they would demand that I would make a verbal expression of why and what I did, what I felt. Well, I said, just look at the photograph. That's all I can say about it. And it's a very important point because you cannot, it isn't that you don't become critical, and I can look at this and I can see how I could have improved, but I never could put into words the particular feeling and the emotion of this particular moment. Because it's contained in the photograph. And it's impossible to put into words just what you feel. You yes. just say that I think this photograph has it or it doesn't have it. Or I can tell you what camera or lens or film and all those could be called chatter. But when it comes right down to tell you what I felt or what I tried to, or what I saw and what I felt in the emotional sense, you have to leave it to the print to explain that. But you use but, the camera almost like a poet would use the pen to write in, or a painter well, the brush. I guess so. If it isn't too pretentious to say that, I guess that's close to it, yeah. Yes. In music, the comparison would be that you... Well, I'm both the composer and the performer. Yes. I'd like to know who the next performer's going to be. <laughs> you have obviously a very strong romantic streak in you. Oh, I admit nature. that freely, yes. <laughs> I but I mean to. romantic in its true sense, because it also has the menacing, dramatic side of romantic. When you think about the romantic painters like Fuseli or Caspar David Friedrich, they have the same menacing quality. Well, doesn't it, in a sense, mean that the subject still has something to do with it? Yes. And uh, this is still a thunderstorm in Cimarron, New Mexico. And it was a tremendously dramatic scene. There's this magnificent view of the Southern Sierra, and this was a very dramatic and difficult thing to, to photograph technically, and I, I think I solved it fairly well, but it's a matter of extreme contrast, and it, uh, it is popular, I think, because it is very dramatic. What is it that you drawn to so much to nature untouched by human beings? Well, it's, uh, it's simpler, and it is... Uh, uh, it's just confused with, uh, with different meanings. There's some people that always demand some humanity <clears throat> in nature. There's some, especially a pictorial group, as we call it, uh, would demand that there be a monk standing by this church gate, you see. I can't, uh, uh, you should not looking at it as a thing of beauty in pure form. Do you think it has also yeah. something to do that it lends a sort of timeless quality to the photograph? Yeah. It takes it out of any immediate, uh, superficial human connotation. Uh, this is the Mission Santa Fe del Bach in <clears throat> southern Arizona. And it's probably the most, America's most beautiful uh, Spanish type in the structure. And a thing like this is very hard to photograph. Uh, it doesn't look that way, and it shouldn't look that way, the spectator, but trying to get these elements and these distant things to work, I had to use a very short focal length lens, and the slightest movement of the camera changes position. See, I could, I could move the camera two inches to the left, and this would impinge here, and all kinds of 
Even now, after I've taken it, I can see where I could have improved it a little bit by moving. Do you think a photograph represents reality, or does it interpret reality? Oh, I, it should be an interpretation. It can also be a document. It can represent it. And there's no doubt that this is Mission Santa Fe del Bach, but it's only a fragment of it. And again, an interpretation of a statement of feeling about this particular fragment. I also think by just showing a fragment, you capture the essence of the church. Yes, very often much more. And then another point would be, <clears throat> this is only photographed too, Rose and Driftwood. Uh, this was an ordinary rose, but I found that if I used a short lens, it came in very closely, I had what is called a looming, a feeling of coming towards you, a space. And the lens, had it been twice as long, I think this was a four inch, if I'd used a lens that was eight inches, this would have had a certain flatness. Rather desolate flatness. But you've taken the most natural object and it almost looks artificial. Well, yeah, I guess. It isn't artificial in the sense that I contrived it and composed it, but it... Uh, I mean, it has become an object rather than that's, that's, nature. That's a good way to put it. It's become an object in itself. Yes. Mr. Adams, you're not normally known as a people's photographer, but you have done quite a few portraits. Well, I worked professionally. I did a great many people and things related to people and things with people and, and things for themselves. I did uh, portraitures professionally, but I never liked it because, again, if it didn't stir me to do something on my own with people, it is very difficult to try to manufacture something you just don't understand. And it's failures on my part, not in their part, or not in their necessarily in their character. It's just that I I, I couldn't control it, so, but I did it as good as I could, and sometimes they liked it and sometimes they didn't. I liked this one because of the uh, peculiar quality of light, and uh, again, there was a certain nostalgia in my mind because of the person involved, a very dear old lady from Independence, California. Uh, this is an interesting image, and this was the... Uh, uh, camp near the shipyards at Richmond, and both parents were off working in the yards on probably double shifts, and this boy was keeping the little kids under control. There's actually four of them, and this little kid was being interviewed, and he was scared to death. But the intense element of the thing I see, again, the picture of my mind's eye, and I reach for another camera, a little rolly flex. And I've had no chance to really compose. The whole thing was done in just a matter of a minute. But it's very difficult to print. But it has a certain uh, quality that I like, and I would put it in with my good work. These children were obviously not aware that their photograph no. was taken. But Except when you... I think the little baby was. Yes, that's right. But when you look at the next one, that's a much more posed picture, because these people knew that their photograph was taken. Yeah, that's a very good point. They did. and. Uh, <clears throat> It was a farm family up in the Sierra Nevada foothills. So they were sitting there, and I was looking around for some, because I had to do the picture, you know. And uh, I thought I found a pretty good location. And then I turned back, and there they were, and that was better than anything. So uh, I just moved in, and uh, we got it. But this picture is coming up. It's a very recent one. Yeah, no, yeah, about November last year. I mean, her face is almost like a landscape. Well, she's an incredible person and one of the very great artists. I said, I want to make a photograph. And uh, she said, oh, why? Why don't you find somebody that's worthy of photographing or some such silly comment? <laughs> so I said, well, I've got it very simple. And, uh, and she sat down, and I just looked around, and she was just waiting. And uh, I just saw it was trying to organize these various leaves so they seemed to work, we say. So then I said, let's go. So she just looks at the camera, and I do it. That's all there is to it. And then, of course, who keeps well, my husband, our husband, the Alfred Stieglitz. This is a color photograph, interesting. In the sense, it's done on one of the early Kodachromes, very early 1940s. 
and uh, we had this print made fairly recently, but uh, the color held very well. It is, it... And it's just sitting in his office with a window light and no artificial light. But talking about color, you do prefer photographing in black and white. I still do, although now with the modern material, things are getting better. But color always seems to cheapen a bit the photo. I mean, is it advertising well, which has done that? Uh, in a sense, see, most advertising photographs are all done with controlled light. And the color value is selected, and they, they make the recording. When you get out into nature, you have a variation of what we call Kelvin or color temperature, uh, com a very complex contrast problem. And you can't do anything with it. I mean, the nature, the green may be very beautiful, and the ocean color out there may be beautiful. But it puts to, comes together with what the film says is realistic, it'd be very ugly. So part of the visualization that you'd have to consider would be what's going to happen to color? How can I control this color? And can we have a look at your gallery? I think there are some of the larger ones. Yes, yeah, sure. So it would be very nice to take a look there. So. Fortunately, that when we design the house, we can have room for gallery space and dark room. This must be your most famous picture, isn't it? Well, it's the best known, I guess. Yeah, it's uh, it's been rather popular. Does it bother you that? this image has become so popular and now become this museum piece? No, I think it's good that uh, people like it. I think sometimes the values attributed to it outside are excessive, but it's completely out of my control. This could be seen, and I just happened to see it at an extraordinary moment. And the picture was actually made with a leeway of about 30, 15 seconds, because the sun went off the crosses. He illuminated from a very western sun going along the edge of clouds. Would you call this a perfect picture? No, it's, it comes pretty close to it, but uh, I couldn't find the exposure meter. And I had to rely on what I knew was the brightness of the moon, or the luminance of the moon, as we say. And I could have given it more exposure with a little more support in the lower areas, but I can't scry over spilt milk. Have you taken the perfect picture yet? No, the best picture is around the corner, like prosperity. <laughs>